Welcome everyone uh, to the first day of the ISB microbiome series for this year. Uh, like Sean said, my name is Nick Quinn Bowman and I'm a graduate student in the Gibbons lab and I'll be your instructor for today's part of the course. I'm so glad that you could join us here today for the course um, and I hope that you'll also join us after the course for a wonderful talk uh, as well as for the next two days of the microbiome series. Uh, we have another part of the course tomorrow uh, and we'll finish up on Friday with our symposium uh, with several talks from some wonderful folks in the microbiome field that have very exciting research to share with you all. Uh, that being said, let's go ahead and get started with today's portion of the course, which will focus on Amplicon sequencing data analysis using CHIME 2. First, let's make sure that everyone is set up with the necessary materials for the course. Uh, the first thing that you'll need is the slides that I'm looking at right now. Uh, the slides are available to you in the introductory email that was sent, uh, and the TAs will also be posting a link to the slides on the Slack channel soon if they haven't already. So I encourage you to open these slides and follow along as we go through instruction today. Um, as well as going back through the slides if you need a refresher on any parts that you might have missed. So uh, if you have any trouble opening the slides up, please go on Slack and let the TAs know. They'll be more than happy to help you out uh, in finding those slides. I'll touch quickly on sort of how the course is organized. Um, as with previous years, there is three main components that make up the course. First and foremost, we have the lecture slides that you should have just been able to access. This is where we'll talk about the logic behind some of the methods that we'll be working through today, go through some explanations of, of the processes that we'll be analyzing, uh, as well as talk about pertinent information and link out to some, some of this information uh, for you to peruse uh, at your own time. Additionally, we'll have the interactive course notebook. Uh, in this notebook, you'll, we'll go over some of the test technical aspects of the course, uh, and you'll be able to actually follow along with us as we analyze data in real time. Uh, we'll be going through anal processing data, analyzing it, and creating visualizations that will let us learn a little bit more about the data that we're working with today. This is also where all the materials that you'll need to, uh, to run the course uh, will be located. Uh, last but not least, we do have a chat for the course. You should have been able to access uh, the Slack channel, either via the introductory email or the link that was shared on Zoom earlier. Um, this is a great resource for you if you have any questions or need any technical support. We have several TAs on this end that are uh, ready and waiting for you to help you with, with any questions. As a reminder, the Zoom chat won't be monitored as actively as the Slack chat. So if you do have any questions, I do encourage you to go to the, uh, the Slack for, for any help. All right, so as I mentioned, uh, all the analysis that we'll, we'll be working on today will take place in our interactive notebook. So if you have these slides open, you can go ahead and click on this link to access that notebook. A link is also available in the email that was sent to you as well as on Slack. So let's go ahead and, and click this to open the notebook uh, and switch to that and get ourselves set up. I'll give you all a second to open up that notebook. And hopefully you all see something that looks like this. So this is our interactive notebook that we'll be using again to run through the actual data analysis component of today's course. Um, before we begin though, I would encourage you to make a copy of this notebook in your own Google Drive. That'll allow you to save your work and come back to it later on uh, if you so desire. Uh, so to do that, we'll go to this toolbar on the top left side of the, of the page, uh, click on file, and about halfway down, you'll see an option that says save a copy and drive. So go ahead and click that. If you haven't logged into to Google, uh, you may be prompted to do so. Um, and this will save a copy of the notebook directly into your Google Drive. And you'll see on the top left, it says copy of uh, the notebook. So we can rename that to be something a bit more meaningful. Uh, for instance, I'll just call it uh, Nick. Great, so now we have our own copy of uh, the notebook. But what exactly is the notebook? What are we looking at here? Well, you can kind of imagine this to be an interactive document that again, will allow you to run through the data analysis components of the course. Um, the notebook is divided into different cells, some of which contain text, like this first one that's highlighted here, and some of which 
contain actual code that we'll be running. So those are the cells that are a little bit darker gray, and they'll have this play button at the very at the on the left hand side of the cell. Uh, let's familiarize ourselves a little bit more. So on the left hand side, we see these four icons on this panel here. Now uh, the first icon will open a table of contents, and that will kind of let us know uh, what we'll be working through today uh, and the, the general workflow of our, of our course. A little bit more exciting though uh, is this last icon down here. So this is our file directory. Um, and right now we see that there's nothing in it except for some sample data that we won't be using. Uh, so let's go ahead and, and fix that. So the first cell that we'll run in our notebook will actually copy in all the materials that we'll need for the course today uh, directly from GitHub. You'll notice that many of the cells in our notebook start with this exclamation point. And so the reason for that is that our CoLab notebook that we're using is actually uh, running Python code as a default. Uh, a lot of the commands we'll be running today are actually meant to be run in the command line. So to tell the notebook that it should expect a command line action, we'll uh, prefix the, the bit of code with uh, an exclamation point. So let's go ahead and run this. Um, and so this will save this course materials directly onto the Google CoLab server. Uh, and it won't copy anything to your local machine, so don't worry about that. Um, and this should only take a couple minutes to copy, or a couple seconds to copy all of the materials over. Right, so now if we look at our file directory on the left-hand side, we should see a new directory called materials. If you don't see that right away, you can press the second icon here, uh, and that'll refresh your file directory. If we open up the materials directory, we can see a whole bunch of stuff that was just downloaded that we'll need for the course, both today and tomorrow. Um, now, in order to, to actually use this material, uh, let's change our active working directory to be this materials directory. And that's what we'll do in this next cell. So if we run this cell, the working directory will change to be materials. Uh, and that just will make it easier for us later on to find our relevant data and the resources that we'll need. Um, Great. So then now the, the last thing that we need to do uh, in order to set up our notebook for us to use it for analysis today is to install Chime 2. So as you might remember from the title of today's course, um, we'll be using a computational library today called Chime 2. Um, and that involves, uh, and uh, using Chime 2 involves it, uh, downloading it and then installing and setting it up within our notebook. Um, this process itself will take about 10 to 15 minutes. So let's go ahead and uh, run this cell. So it'll it'll start in the background. Uh, and again, this will only set it up in the Google Colab notebook, not on the local machine. OK, so like I said, this will take a little bit of time. So as the notebook finishes setting up for us to use later, let's switch back over to the presentation uh, and discuss a little bit of background information about what we'll be doing today and some of the implementation. Uh, and again, if you run into any issues with uh, setting up the notebook or accessing the notebook, please don't hesitate to ask on Slack. Uh, the TAs will be more than healthy, happy to help you. Great. So now we're back on to the, the lecture slides. Uh, one more thing I'd like to mention. If at any point during the course today uh, you lose access to your notebook, or you somehow aren't able to complete a one of the cells, uh, and you are missing any output that's necessary to complete the rest of the notebook, um, all of the outputs we generate today can be found in the treasure chest folder. Uh, this is available both at the GitHub that's linked out here, as well as in the materials folder that we just downloaded into our Google Colab notebook. So if you are missing anything, uh, that can be found in that treasure chest. Again, if you have any issues with that, just ask the TAs. They'll be happy to help you. Great. So now we'll start a little bit of background. By virtue of you being here today, I have assumed that you're somewhat familiar with what the gut microbiome is. But just in case, um, we'll have a quick little refresher. So when we talk about the gut microbiome, we're talking about the 30 to 40 trillion bacterial cells on average that live in the human large intestine. Specifically, these cells live in the mucus layer that lines the large intestine. Uh, and importantly, they're very heterogeneous between individuals. That is, um, you and me and everyone else in this course has a very unique and distinct set of metabolite or, um, microbes that live in our large intestine. Um, so what exactly do these, these microbes do for us? Well, there's a number of things. Um, one of the primary things that they, they do in our body is they help us digest food. 
So things like resistant starch or cellulose that our body can't break down makes its way into the large intestine and is consumed by these bacteria. Um, they'll then produce other metabolites that can go back into the body and have a number of either positive or, or adverse health effects from uh, mitigating or modulating inflammation um, to increasing our risk for cardiovascular disease. Um, and that's not all that the microbiome does in, in terms of affecting our health. It's also in, involved in training our immune system, uh, modulating our, our uh, mood through the gut-brain axis, which is still being fully understood, uh, and determining how susceptible we are to pathogenic invasion of our microbiome, which we'll talk a little bit more about uh, throughout the, the duration of the course. So as we can see, the microbiome itself uh, does uh, significantly affect our health, uh, and the composition of bacteria that are present in this community is very important in terms of dictating sort of our overall health trajectory. So this might lead you to wonder, how do we know what's in someone's microbiome? How can we actually measure and, and determine what microbes are present in any one person's microbiome? Um, so to do that, that's actually not a, a, a trivial question. Um, first and foremost, there's hundreds to thousands of taxa in each individual, and it's actually fairly difficult to culture these taxa outside of their resident environment in the large intestine. So instead, we can do what's called sequencing of the DNA instead. So we take a fecal sample from any individual and extract the DNA, read that DNA, and use that to determine what microbes are present and in what, um, in, in what abundances. Uh, but this in itself raises a few questions as well. One, how do we go about getting the sequencing data? And secondly, once we have that sequencing data, how do we um, process it and analyze it? Oops. So to answer that second question first, I'd like to introduce you to a computational tool called Chime. So spelled Q-I-I-M-E, but pronounced Chime like a wind chime. Uh, this is a tool that's meant for the processing and analyzing of micro, uh, microbial sequencing data um, in order to make that process a little easier and more transparent. So CHIME was created around 2010 during the Human Microbiome Project under the leadership of doctors Greg Caparazzo and Rob Knight. And with the release of CHIME, what they sought to do was take this process of going from raw sequencing reads uh, and transforming them into a format that was allowed us to get meaningful um, outputs from that raw sequencing data uh, and streamline that process, make it a little bit more easier for researchers to conduct uh, and more transparent in terms of uh, determining exactly what transformations were made to this data. And that's exactly what they do with Chime. Around 2016, Chime 2 was released, which is a new implementation of Chime uh, that introduced new semantic types to Chime, as well as more of an emphasis on analysis transparency. So what exactly is Chime that we're talking about here? Well, to, to borrow a phrase from directly from the Chime 2 documentation, uh, Chime 2 is a powerful, extensible, and decentralized microbiome analysis package that has a focus on data processing and analysis transpar transparency. So sort of like we already talked about. Um, and I would say that's a, a very good uh, description of exactly what we can do with Chime. Um, but in terms of actually using it, what can we do with Chime and, and how do we implement it? Well, essentially, Chime is actually just a set of commands that we can use to transform mi raw microbiome sequencing data into intermediate outputs, as well as visualizations that give us context and information about the communities that we're looking at. As you can see in the um, little GIF here, it's most commonly used via the command line. Today, we'll actually use it within the CoLab notebook, um, but it's actually very straightforward to use uh, and allows us to uh, streamline this process of going from raw sequencing data um, and, come and transform that into meaningful outputs that we can use to learn a lot more about our microbial communities uh, and visualize them as well. So before we talk a little bit more about Chime, uh, I'd like to mention that 
Chime 2 itself comes with a lot of help. So if you are interested in using this outside of uh, today's course, um, there's a large range of, of tutorials uh, that'll teach you more about individual parts of the Chime 2 pipeline, general documentation that will help you learn, understand more of the methodology that's used, as well as a very useful user forum where you can go to ask questions or take a look at questions that have already been asked. Um, today, we'll go through sort of a, a basic version of the, the Chime 2 pipeline, uh, but there's a lot of really cool uh, and powerful things that you can do with Chime um, that we won't touch on all of, uh, of that today. And so I do encourage you to take a look at those tutorials and the documentation if you are interested in using this more for your own purposes. Great. So before we jump into actually using Chime, I think it's important to touch on um, how we um, how uh, Chime 2 is organized. <clears throat> so generally, Chime 2 manages what are called artifacts, which are essentially uh, intermediate data files that we can use to store the output of different Chime um, actions, uh, which then feed into other methods uh, within Chime. It also produces what are called visualizations, which are essentially endpoints of the Chime 2 pipeline that allow us to infer or draw conclusions about our data. For instance, on the right-hand side, we can see an example of the Chime 2 pipeline that we'll be following today. So um, first, we start with our raw sequences. In this case, green rectangles represent Chime 2 artifacts. So our raw sequences, we import as an artifact. That then feeds into a method, which is a, a yellow rectangle. Uh, for instance, demultiplexing your data. Today, we won't actually demultiplex our data. Um, but if, for instance, you had multiple samples within a single sequencing run, demultiplexing would separate those samples out uh, and so we could isolate them individually. This demultiplex function then creates a new Chime2 uh, artifact, demultiplex sequences, which goes into another Chime2 method, uh, and so on and so forth. At the very end of the pipeline, we'll see that there are also these uh, blue boxes, which represent visualizations. So again, visualizations are, uh, rather than being, <clears throat> excuse me, inter, uh, intermediate files, these are actually endpoint files um, that allow us to take a look at statistics or perhaps graphs that describe our data and allow us to draw um, conclusions and gain some ecological insight about the communities that are being sequenced and uh, looked at in these cases. So uh, one thing to remember is that, uh, like we touched on, artifacts are really just meant for, um, artifacts represent intermediate steps. So we don't necessarily use artifacts to look at directly in terms of drawing conclusions about our data. Uh, instead, for that, we use visualizations, which are endpoints men meant for human consumption. Uh, for this reason, though, visualizations cannot be used as inputs for additional commands. So we can't go ahead and build an, a visualization and then plug that back into the Chime 2 pipeline. Um, so this was generally just a, a, a high-level description of what Chime 2 is, uh, how we might go about using it, and its general uh, structure. And as we go through the course, we'll get a little bit more technical about using individual Chime 2 commands and how we go about doing that. Um, but if you recall the question that I posed earlier, this only answers one of those, the, those two questions, which was how do we process and analyze microbial sequencing data? The first question I asked was, how do we actually go about getting that sequencing data? And so let's take a, take a look at that, um, which I think is very important considering that this is sort of the basis of all the data analysis that we'll be using, uh, that we'll be running today. So when we talk about sequencing microbial communities, there's really two primary methods that you might use. First, uh, and the method that we'll be using, or that generated the data that we'll be using today uh, is called amplicon sequencing. So in this case, after extracting DNA from our samples, rather than sequencing all the data, or excuse me, all the DNA that's present in the sample, we'll actually just focus on one small part of a gene that's called a marker gene. Uh, this marker gene is, is somewhat special because it has two very important parts. Uh, one is a small conserved region that's identical between all of the taxa present in our samples. We need this conserved region in order to add a PCR primer uh, that will attach to that conserved region and um, extend a DNA read. Uh, 
after the conserved region, we also need what's called a variable region. So these are unique to the individual taxa that are present in our um, individual taxa that are present in our samples. So after extracting DNA, uh, we'll add our PCR primers that will attach to those conserved regions uh, and amplify that one small part of the marker gene. We can then sequence just uh, those PCR amplification pieces um, and get uh, and use those the, the sequencing results of that variable region to go back and determine where each piece of DNA came from. Uh, as you can see, by just sequencing a much smaller part of the genome, uh, we can minimize the amount of, of uh, sequencing and computational labor that's required. In bacterial communities, we most often use the 16S gene as our marker as our marker gene. And uh, we use specific regions of that 16S gene uh, as our conserved and variable. Uh, parts, uh, conserved and variable uh, amplification pieces. Another option that you might use for sequencing microbial communities is what's called shotgun metagenomics. So in this case, after extracting our DNA, we'll cut it up into smaller bits in a process that's called fragmentation. And then essentially using random PCR primers, we will, um, uh, random primers, we will uh, sequence the entire genome. So all the DNA that's present in our samples. And at the end, what we'll end up with is uh, small pieces that cover the full genome of each taxon present in our sample. This can be pretty useful for certain kinds of analyses. For instance, if you're looking at functional metagenomics, so the genomic capacity of the entire community. Um, but as you can imagine, this also is much more intensive in terms of the amount of sequencing that's required, as well as the, the computational effort that's required. Uh, it ends up being much more expensive. So for the um, data that we're looking at today, uh, we'll be focusing only on the left-hand side, which is amplicon sequencing. Like I mentioned, for bacterial communities, we most often use the 16S gene as our marker gene. Uh, so why is that? Well, the 16S gene, importantly, uh, codes for a subunit of the ribosome. And since we know all bacteria need ribosomes in order to survive, um, we can safely assume that this gene is present in all of the taxa within our sample. Additionally, the 16S gene has that morphology that we were talking about previously. It has conserved regions that are shown in blue uh, that are nearly identical between all of the taxa in our sample, um, and which we can use to attach a PCR primer. Uh, it also has interspersed between those conserved regions, hypervariable regions that are shown in pink uh, that display phylogenetic heterogeneity. That is, they are uh, very specific to the taxon that they come from. Most often, uh, we use either the V3 or V4 hypervariable region. Uh, the data that we're using today actually does sequence the, that V4 region of the 16S gene. All right, so that was just a general overview. Um, but now let's consider and, and talk about what we'll actually be working on today uh, within our notebook. So the theme of this year's course was how the ecology of our gut microbiome protects us from invasion by pathogenic bacteria. Um, and today we'll be actually be analyzing the microbial composition of the gut microbiome of individuals with recurrent C. difficile infections, or C. diff for short. C. diff is an opportunistic pathogen that will come in often after antibiotics are, are taken by an individual, uh, invade the microbiome, and can lead to all sorts of pretty nasty symptoms from um, diarrhea and inflammation, uh, to in severe cases, internal hemorrhaging and even death. Uh, it's also really difficult to get rid of. Adding more antibiotics can lead to what's called a recurrent infection that uh, starts a cycle um, of, of reinfection. Interestingly, it seems that the uh, composition of one's gut microbiome can dictate how at risk you might be for the invasion of C. difficile. And in fact, some people can actually carry C. difficile asymptomatically for years, so they don't have any of these bad symptoms. Uh, and we'll talk about this some more uh, in tomorrow's part of the course with Alex as well. So today we'll be looking at 16S amplicon sequencing from that V4 region of the 16S gene from human fecal samples in four healthy donors that do not have a C. difficile infection, as well as four individuals that do have recurrent infection of C. difficile. And we'll be comparing how the, the composition of those microbiomes sort of varies between, between folks. 
if you're interested in learning more about um, the data that we're using today, uh, you're welcome to follow the link that's uh, shown on the screen here, and that'll take you to a publication um, from which these, these data are, are collected. So when we talk about C. difficile, uh, like I mentioned, typically C. difficile presents itself uh, in individuals that have been taken into, have taken antibiotics for one reason or another. Um, and it's more, more common in, in folks that have also been staying in, in a hospital. If you combine that with a weakened immune system, um, and all, as well as possibly a previous infection, uh, you drastically increase your risk of contracting and, and uh, getting infection of C. difficile. And so we can quickly take a look at the infection cycle. Uh, and look at how recurrent C. difficile infection typically presents. So like I said, someone, you might be given antibiotics for one reason or another, you have a bacterial infection. And those antibiotics are meant to wipe out the bad bacteria, which they might, but as an un, uh, unintended consequence, they might also wipe out a bunch of your good gut microbes that are, are living in your, in your um, gut microbiome. Uh, what this does is essentially opens up a bunch of real estate for C. difficile to come in um, and take over the microbiome uh, and make you pretty sick, which is what we see uh, in this individual with the sad face. Um, an easy approach to, that you might consider to um, get rid of C. difficile is to add more antibiotics, which would kill off, kill off the C. difficile. But you can also see how this would essentially just open up more space in the gut microbiome uh, and open someone up to recurrent infection. So it's a pretty tricky problem to solve. One therapy that actually has proven very successful in treating C. difficile is what's called a fecal, fecal microbiota transplant. So in this case, we take a fecal sample from a healthy individual, isolate the microbiome, and engraft it in the microbiome and graft it uh, into a, an individual with a recurrent C. difficile infection. Uh, over time, this will eventually this um, engrafted microbiota will uh, expand and essentially push out the C. difficile. Um, and hopefully lead to, again, a, a healthy and balanced microbiome. And FMTs are actually largely successful in treating FMT uh, and are one of the only therapies that really is effective in, in doing so. Okay, so now we have an idea of what sort of data we're looking at. Uh, let's take a look at the overall workflow of what we're actually doing today uh, as far as our analysis. So we will start with raw sequencing data. That comes from the sample count sequencing we just discussed. Um, and we'll feed that into our Chime pipeline. So Chime will go ahead and trim and filter out low quality sequencing reads. It'll also then go through a process in which it infers sequence variants, uh, essentially just finding the most likely set of original sequences that were present in our, in our um, original sample. We'll then also assign taxonomy to each of those sequencing reads. So we know the identity of the taxa present in any individual's microbiome. And then after some data normalization, we'll go ahead and look at some metrics that describe our communities in terms of diversity and uh, gaining more insight into the ecology of the microbiome. First and foremost, we'll have to uh, import our raw data into Chime as an artifact. So if you recall, Chime uses artifacts. Um, and so that, that'll be our first step. So, Let's get started and we'll switch back to the notebook uh, and get started with that. Okay. Okay, so at this point, um, we're back in the notebook. Hopefully your setup of Chime 2 has um, concluded and it all worked well. If you have any issues, please ask the TAs. They'll be more than happy to help you. Um, and now we can actually get started with using our notebook for data analysis. So like I mentioned, we want to start with our raw sequencing data. So let's familiarize ourselves with that. If we go to our left-hand side in our file directory and open this data folder, we'll see that we actually have uh, what are called FASTQ files for each of our eight samples. This is the file type that uh, typically comes out of sort of raw sequencing runs. Uh, and we see we have all eight of our samples. We also have two files at the bottom one called a manifest and one called metadata. And these are both tab separated value files that we can very easily read uh, using a library called pandas. So if we import pandas, let's go ahead and take a look at what our manifest file looks like. And this will only take a second. So here we see our table containing our manifest. And essentially this is just a map that we'll add, we'll give to Chime 
that it will allow it to find and import our raw sequencing files. It's very simple. We just have one column that identifies the sample and a second column that identifies where that sample is located. So we'll use this in our first step in Chime uh, in which we'll import our raw sequencing data uh, as a Chime artifact. Let's also check out the metadata file just to get an idea of what that looks like. So essentially the metadata file, which is also in this data directory, just gives us more context about our samples. So we know we have four healthy samples and four samples with recurrent C. difficile infection. And we can see that in this disease state column over here. There are, might also be other associated metadata in terms of um, age, uh, height, and maybe body mass index. And we'll use this later on when we want to actually compare samples between these two groups. So that looks good. looks like we have all eight of our FASTQ files. Um, and now we can use these data to import our files directly into Chime. So let's go ahead and, and start our Chime 2 pipeline. The first thing we want to do, like we've mentioned, is import our data. That's what this cell here will do. So every time we use Chime, the command will take a, a very similar format. We start with our exclamation point, since this is a command line action. Then we'll call Chime as our library that we're using. Chime has a, uh, several different plugins, which are essentially libraries that allow us to do different things within Chime. In this case, the plugin that we're using is called Tools, which is sort of general, but allows us to import our data. Finally, we'll specify the action we want to do, in this case, uh, import. Like I mentioned um, very briefly, so you might have missed it, um, the release of Chime 2 included the, in, um, the introduction of semantic types, which essentially means um, it specified what kind of data needs to be put into each um, portion or each um, part of the Chime 2 pipeline. So in this case, we'll tell Chime what's, what type of data to expect. In this case, since we're importing our raw sequences, uh, we're looking at sample data as the type. We'll also specify our input path. So again, we'll be using that manifest file as sort of a map to tell Chime these are our, sequen these are our, our samples and this is where the sequences can be found. And then we'll also specify an output path. In this case, the output path is a Chime artifact that we'll call sequences. All Chime artifacts take on the a file name that ends with .qzv. That stands, or is qza, excuse me. That stands for Chime zipped artifact. We'll also tell Chime the the format of our, our sequencing data, uh, which in this case is single end, since we we only sequence in one direction, as opposed to paired end, where you sequence in in two directions. Um, as well as uh, their FASTQ files, uh, and we're importing using a manifest. So let's go ahead and run this cell. Uh, and this should only take about 20 to 30 seconds. Um, and in the end, what we'll see is that we should have a Chime artifact called sequences.qza, which we can then use to start our Chime pipeline. And this will show up uh, on the left-hand side in our file directory in just a second um, when this uh, cell finishes and it looks like it's just about done. Again, if you don't see it right away, you can hit this refresh icon uh, and you should see it near the bottom here, sequences.qza. Great, so now we have our sequences um, and we can theoretically move forward with the um, pipeline, um, but often you wanna double check that uh, at intermittent points in the pipeline, we wanna double check that our data kind of looks the way we would expect it to. Uh, and in this case, we might be interested in looking at whether or not our uh, sequencing data looks like it's of good quality. Right now though, all we have is a Chime artifact. And if you recall, uh, artifacts aren't really meant for us to take a look at directly. Um, so instead, what we wanna do is use that artifact to build a visualization. Uh, and that's what we'll do in this, this next section here. So um, if we run this cell, essentially what we're doing is we're calling Chime again, um, and we're using the DMUX plugin. So DMUX is, is meant for demultiplexing sequences, which like we mentioned in the slides, we won't actually do. Um, but within the DMUX plugin, there's a tool called Summarize that we will be using. So here we'll tell Chime to take our input data, which is this sequences.qza file, and build a visualization, which we'll call qualities.qzv. So let's go ahead and run this cell. And yeah, this shouldn't take long. Um, Importantly, visualizations in Chime all take on a file name that ends with QZV, so Chime zipped visualization. 
Um, so that's how you can identify between artifacts and visualizations is the, the end of the file name. Um, so how do we actually look at these visualizations though? Well, unfortunately we can't look at them directly within our Google Colab notebook. But luckily Chime actually does uh, offer us a, a very useful tool that we can use um, to look at our visualizations. Um, so when this finishes here in just a second, looks like it's about done. Um, we'll go to our file directory, locate the visualization we just constructed, qualities.qzv. And if we go to the right-hand side of this column, you'll see three little dots. Click on those and then download the file. And this will download it locally. Now, if we want to take a look at that visualization, we can open view.chime2.org. And you'll find a link to that uh, within the notebook as well. So if we go to view.chime2.org, we'll see something that looks like this. So, and there's this big gray rectangle that says drag or, and drop or click here. Uh, so what we want to do is import our um, uh, visualization that we just downloaded. So I'll go ahead and click on qualities.qzv that we just downloaded, uh, open that, and right away we can see our visualization. So congratulations, we've now made our first Chime visualization. Uh, visualizations don't always take on the format of a, a graph or a heat map or anything. Sometimes they also look like, like this and they have you know, data tables um, and multiple parts. So um, let's take a look at what this is essentially telling us and determine if our sequencing data is of good quality. So first and foremost, we see this uh, summary of our sequencing counts from each of our, our samples. At minimum, it looks like the sample with the fewest counts is about 25,000 reads, and our maximum is, is well over 100,000 reads. As a general rule of thumb, we want at least 10,000 reads per sample uh, to be confident in our sequencing. So this should be more than enough uh, for our purposes here today. We'll also see this data represented as a histogram here um, with all eight of our samples. Uh, and then also a table that just lists the number of reads for each one of our, our samples. Uh, in this case, since we did not we did single end sequencing, we don't have any reverse reads to show. If you did paired end sequencing, you would see a similar histogram and table uh, for those reverse reads. So this is great, but it doesn't really tell us about the quality of our sequencing, just the number of sequences we have for each sample. To really get at the quality, uh, we'll go to the top left side here and click on the second tab that says interactive quality plot. And this is the more interesting part, in my opinion. So here we can see what is essentially a, uh, a graph des describing the quality of our sequencing as a function of the length of the sequence. So on the x-axis here, we can see uh, the number of bases in each sequence as it gets longer uh, with a maximum length of 151 bases. So the longest read in our data is 151 bases long. On the y-axis, we have a quality score, which is a little bit ambiguous uh, at first, um, but essentially tells us the error rate or the estimated error rate of our sequencing results. So every time we sequence a piece of DNA, there's a chance that the sequencer will make a mistake and assign a base incorrectly. So it might assign an A when it should have assigned a T or uh, for instance. Um, and that's what this quality score describes. In general, a higher quality score is better. Um, and a good rule of thumb is that a quality score of 10 correlates with an estimated error percentage of 10%. So in that case, 10% of the reads in your sequence would be uh, labeled incorrectly. Uh, it decreases logarithmically though. So a quality score of 20 corresponds to an error rate of 1%, 30 of 0.1%, and a error rate of, uh, excuse me, a quality score of 40 uh, indicates an error rate of 0.01%. So generally, any quality score between 30 and 40, we can feel very good about. Um, between 20 and 30 is, is still pretty good. We can feel relatively confident about that. As it starts to get lower towards uh, a quality score of around 10, um, that's where we don't really want to be using those data anymore because we can't feel confident about the quality of those base assignments anymore. So how do we use this data uh, and the, the results from this uh, moving forward? Well. Uh, within Chime, one of the steps that we'll be following is called uh, is uh, trimming our reads. So 
using these, this quality score graph, we can determine where along this x-axis we'd like to trim our reads, meaning that we'll only use uh, reads that are at that level or shorter. Um, and we'll essentially get rid of any reads above a certain level. So based on this graph, um, maybe some of you can, can post on Slack and if you have any ideas of where on this graph you might truncate your reads. So what sequence base uh, you might choose to cut off everything to the right of that. Um, and if anyone has an idea, yeah, maybe put it on Slack. Uh, and while you do that, I'll say a couple more things about this plot. Um, you often see that the sequencing does, um, the quality score does decrease as a function of, of length. So typically as the reads get longer, sequencing uh, quality score, excuse me, gets a little bit worse. Um, you often also see this sort of uh, relationship where the first couple bases seem to be of, of poor quality as well. Uh, and that's actually just an artifact of how quality score is, um, is calculated since it takes into account preceding bases as well. And obviously there's uh, no base before base number one. So the quality score is artificially a little bit lower there. You can also see down here uh, a seven number summary for each of the positions within our graph. So if we zoom in on a piece of the graph, we can do that by clicking and dragging. We'll see these are actually box plots that describe the quality score at each position. And if we click on one, uh, we can see the, the seven number summary showing the sort of upper and lower uh, trends of quality score at that position. If we double click on the graph, we zoom back out. So do we have any guesses on Slack for what a, a good truncation length might be? Great, yeah, so these are all good guesses. Um, and yeah, so keeping in mind, we want to cut off essentially any bases that are of, of low quality. So in this case, um, like I said, anything above 30, we can feel pretty confident about. Um, so since our so only our, our last base really um, falls significantly below uh, a quality score of 30, um, we'll go ahead and truncate at a length of, of 150. So we'll only get rid of that last base. And uh, quite frankly, with, with data that looks like this, you really don't have to worry too much about truncation um, since most of the, the bases are at pretty good quality. Um, but it is important to remember if you're working with your own data uh, and maybe the, the read lengths are a little bit longer uh, to consider that as the read lengths get longer, the quality scores seem to dip a little bit. So always remember to take a look at that uh, and consider that when you're deciding where to truncate your reads. Okay, let's switch back over to the notebook and see how we can implement implement that truncation length. Great, so now we have our, our data as, uh, excuse me, our, our sequences as a Chime2 artifact, and we can use it to start that Chime2 pipeline. The first step in the pipeline, as you might remember, is this filter and trim step. So we're essentially filtering out low quality reads. Um, and this step is called denoising. And it, to, to denoise our data, we'll use a plugin that's called Data2. And this does a number of things for us. Uh, first, it filters and trims the reads. So like we just discussed, it'll uh, trim the sort of the ends off the reads that are of low quality. It'll also remove any reads that are just of, of low quality uh, overall. Uh, it'll also go through this process of identifying ASVs, which we'll talk about more in detail when we switch back to the slides. It'll remove uh, chimeras, which are artifacts from, from PCR implication. And then finally, it'll go ahead and uh, count the abundances of each of the ASVs that it, that it identifies in step two. So obviously this step is doing a lot. So this end, ends up being one of the, the longer steps that we'll have to, to do. So um, let's briefly take a look at what this cell is doing. Uh, then we'll run it and switch back to the notebook while it continues, because it usually takes about 10 to 12 minutes um, so while that's running, we'll switch back over to the notebook. So first, let's look at the cell though. We're calling Chime, and within Chime, the Data2 plugin. Uh, and the specific action is called denoise single. Single, again, because we're using single end sequencing as opposed to paired end sequencing. We'll give it our sequences. So these are, this is the Chime artifact with our raw sequencing data. And we'll also identify that truncation length that we just chose uh, as a, from our, our quality scores. Um, if you chose different truncation length, this is where you would input that. Um, but I recommend for now to stick with a truncation length of 150. Uh, we'll also identify the number of CPUs that we want the 
um, the server to use. In this case, two is the maximum we have available to us. And this will increase the, the speed of computation. Finally, we'll tell it where to put all of our outputs from this, um, from this process. So the denoise process actually produces several artifacts rather than just one. So we'll specify a directory that we want it to put all of the outputs into, and we'll call that data. Uh, we'll also add this verbose flag, so it'll essentially just tell us what it's doing at each step of the process. So let's go ahead and hit play. And so this will start running. And again, this will take about 10 to 12 minutes to, to get all the way through. And so uh, while that's going, let's switch back over to the, the slides and discuss in more detail what actually we're, we're doing in this step, as well as some of the additional implementation that will come after. All right, so hopefully now you can all see the slides. Um, and yeah, so what we just started was a process called denoising using data to our, our Chime 2 plugin. Um, and like we just mentioned, this is doing a number of things, filtering and trimming, finding ASVs, uh, removing chimeras, and then finally counting the abundances of those ASVs. So this is our review that we just discussed. Uh, but let's take a look at each of these steps individually. All right, so that first step, filtering and trimming. This is doing essentially four separate things. Um, first, we're trimming low quality regions. We just discussed this. Um, we'll, we identify our truncation length and we'll trim all the reads beyond that truncation length, uh, which are of low quality. Second, it'll also remove any reads that are of low average quality throughout. So if some of our reads just have a bad quality score from the start, those reads will be removed. It'll then also remove reads that have what are called ambiguous bases. So sometimes sequencers have trouble identifying a, a base in the sequence. And so it might say, well, I know there's a base there. I don't know what it is. So it'll uh, add to the sequence an N, which is considered ambiguous. So Chime will remove that since it's not really helpful to us moving forward. Lastly, it'll also remove Phi X, which is a bacteriophage genome that's often added to sequencing to make the quality a little bit better. It essentially just increases the diversity of a sample uh, since a really uh, homogeneous sample can um, make the, the can confuse the sequencer and, and lead to poor sequencing quality. Uh, but we don't need it moving forward for our analysis, so Chime will remove Phi X uh, from our sequence reads. Step two is identifying amplicon sequencing variants, or ASVs. So um, this sounds kind of complicated, but it really boils down to exactly what we, we said earlier, uh, which is we want to identify which sequences represent the sequences that were present in our original sample. So like we've just discussed, every time that we sequence a piece of DNA, there's a chance that the sequencer will make a mistake here or there. Um, so at the end, we might end up with several thousand unique sequences that might look similar, but uh, vary in different positions here or there um, due to these errors that the sequencer can make. As it turns out, the errors that the sequencer makes, so identifying or mislabeling a, a base here or there, um, the probability of those errors occurring is actually a function of the quality score, uh, where on the sequence it, the, the error occurs, as well as what kind, of uh, what kind of error is being made specifically. So the probability of an A becoming a T uh, might be higher than the probability of an A becoming a G, just for instance. So, uh, and this can be described by, what, by what's called an error profile, which we kind of see on the, the top right side here. If we knew this error profile ahead of time, it would actually be fairly easy for us to look at those sequence variants um, and identify where the most likely errors were that occurred uh, and work backwards from this to find a corresponding set of the most likely set of sequences that represent the sequences actually present in our original sample with no errors. Alternatively, if we knew what those sequences were, those original you know, sort of ground truth sequences, it would be very easy for us to calculate the, the error profile. Unfortunately, um, in, in practice, we don't know either of these things ahead of time. So data two uses what's called an expectation maximization algorithm uh, to, to um, calculate uh, the real error model um, and find the corresponding set of actual amplicon sequencing variants uh, at the same time. So essentially it does this by first taking a guess at what might be the the, the sort of ground truth amplicon sequence variants. So the, the real sequences with, with no error. So for instance, if it finds um, a set of reads that, that show up several thousand times in the sample um, and look identical, it might assume, okay, this might be one of the sequences that is um, that was actually present in our original sample. 
It can then use that to um, learn and, and calculate an error profile. Uh, and then it continues to iterate this process back and forth until it converges on the true error model of the uh, sequencing data, um, as well as a corresponding set of amplicon sequencing variants that actually represents the most likely set of, of sequences that were present uh, with no errors in our original model, or in our, our original our original sample, excuse me. Um, and this is actually a pretty cool and, and robust algorithm that works very well. Um, and at the end of the day, you might start with you know several thousand different uh, sequence variants with uh, a few changes here and there, and data two will be able to sort of converge those down into a set of you know fifty to one hundred ASVs uh, that are specific um, to the the original sequences that were present in our sample. So this is a pretty cool cool uh, uh, trick that we can we can use to identify those ASVs and end up with a set of representative sequences. That represent the the tax that are present in our in our data. The third thing that uh, Data Two does is it looks for what are called PCR chimeras. Uh, it looks for them and, and removes them. So, PCR chimeras are an artifact that comes out of sequencing, wherein the primer attaches to that conserved region of the 16S gene, and it starts uh, extending through the hypervariable region. Um, but for one reason or another that extension is aborted. So now we have this unfinished piece of DNA kind of floating around. And it might then find a similar piece of DNA, but, a, but importantly, a different one, uh, and miss prime or attach to that piece of DNA, uh, but then continue that extension. And so what we're left with at the end is a chimeric piece of DNA that's half one, uh, that's coming from two separate templates that doesn't uh, represent any of the DNA present in our actual sample. Um, and so we ideally want to remove these, since these can lead to additional artifacts later on when we're trying to design ta taxonomy uh, and can confuse our data in general. So uh, data two will go through and identify and remove these chimeras uh, from, our, from our sequences. Um, the last thing it'll do is then uh, count the abundances of each of the ASVs in our sample uh, and return to us a list of these ASVs. So, these are now sort of the abundances of each of these representative sequences. To this point, though, we don't actually know the identity of any of these ASVs. We just know um, their representative sequence and how abundant they are in each sample. So does anyone have any ideas for what we might be able to do with those, with those data sets? Um, sort of what metrics can we calculate using only that data that can tell us something about our communities? Uh, so it may take a second to so think about that and answer in Slack if you have any ideas. I'll give you a few more seconds here. All right, so unless we have any, any uh, ideas popping up in Slack. Um, Totally, yeah. So I think someone mentioned diversity, uh, and that's exactly what we're going to look at first. So when we're looking at microbial communities like these, uh, one of the things that we're interested in using to describe these communities is sample diversity. And diversity generally comes in two separate flavors. So there's alpha diversity uh, as well as beta diversity. So now, uh, while data two is still running, we'll take a second to uh, go through these and sort of discuss the difference between these kinds of diversity uh, and how we use them to measure and describe our communities. Alpha diversity uh, is pretty straightforward. Uh, essentially, alpha diversity asks the question, how diverse is a single sample? And this can really be uh, boiled down to two different uh, metrics. The first metric is richness. So to determine richness, we can essentially just count the number of taxa that we observe in a community. For instance, this last community on the right side, uh, not very diverse. There's only one taxon that we observe in that community. The second community, though, we see three different taxa, so a little bit more diverse. Uh, and in this first one over here, we also see three different taxa, um, so also somewhat diverse. However, we can also see that this second taxon seems to, or this second community seems to be dominated by this circular taxon. So richness in itself doesn't necessarily describe the overall diversity of our samples. 
Uh, instead, for that, we'll also look at a metric called evenness, which essentially asks, you know, how evenly are the abundances in our sample distributed across the taxa? So do we have one taxon that's, um, you know, dominating the, the overall composition of this community? And so if we take this into account, we can see that there's more diversity happening in, in the, this first community on the left uh, than in the central, uh, the, the center community, um, since there's higher evenness in that community. Commonly, when we're actually measuring alpha diversity, we'll find a metric that combines both richness and evenness to get to paint a, a pretty good picture of the actual alpha diversity of our samples. Uh, so for this, we might use something like Shannon index or Simpson's index. Shannon index essentially tells us uh, how surprised we might be at pulling out um, at uh, finding any specific taxon within our community. For instance, if we look at the community on the right-hand side um, and we at random pick a taxon out and find a circle, um, and then we pull out a, a second taxon and it's again a circle, uh, the, by the third taxon that we pull out randomly, if it's again a circle, we won't be very surprised. And so that's a relatively low uh, Shannon score. On the other hand, if we look at this first community on the left-hand side and randomly pick a taxon, um, and then again, randomly pick a taxon, we might end up um, with a different tax on each time since there's much more diversity here. And that's essentially what Shannon index tells us. Um, it's a metric of, of um, alpha diversity that really represents both richness and evenness. So that's one that we, we commonly use. The neat thing about alpha diversity is that um, at the end of, uh, after you calculate alpha diversity, uh, you're left with a single discrete value for each sample. Um, so that is, it's, it can be, be treated as any other measurement that you might take of a sample. And it makes it very easy to compare uh, to compare samples between each other and perform many of the classic statistical tests that we're familiar with, things like t-tests or Mann-Whitney u-tests, uh, to determine whether there's st statistically significant differences in alpha diversity between our samples. Beta diversity, on the other hand, is a slightly more complicated. So essentially, beta diversity asks how different are uh, two or more samples from one another. So rather than within a sample, this is diversity across samples. And this, again, comes in sort of uh, two different types, uh, similar to the richness and evenness that we saw in alpha diversity. Unweighted beta diversity just asks how many taxa are shared between samples. For instance, the, the this set of communities on the right, we see they couldn't be more different. There is no shared taxa between sample two and sample one. On the other hand, in terms of unweighted beta diversity, uh, the two communities on the left-hand side are perfectly similar. So they have the exact same taxa shared between each other. Um, obviously, we can see that the abundance of these taxa is actually different, but if we only looked at unweighted beta diversity, that wouldn't be taken into consideration. Weighted beta diversity, on the other hand, does account for the abundance of uh, shared taxa between the samples. So in this case, we would see that there is actually different, there is actually um, uh, a difference in weighted beta diversity between sample one and sample two on the left-hand side. Obviously, we still see a very high uh, difference in beta diversity on for the two communities on the right-hand side. So uh, common metrics that we might measure to, to determine beta diversity are what's called the Jacquard index for unweighted beta diversity, um, the Bray-Curtis distance for weighted beta diversity, um, as well as unweighted or weighted unifract distances. Unifrac is uh, additionally special because it takes into account one more consideration, which is um, how different are samples in terms of uh, phylogenetic relatedness of, of taxa within those samples. So we might be wondering, you know, if samples aren't necessarily shared between, uh, excuse me, if taxa aren't necessarily shared between samples, how closely related are the taxa that are present in those samples? And so Unifrac answers that. Well, how does that work? So in order to determine beta diversity while accounting for uh, genetically similar taxa, the first thing we have to do is build what's called a phylogenetic tree. So essentially, this is a tree that um, clusters taxa across all of our sample, all of our samples um, based on how genetically similar they are. So how much their um, genetic sequences diverge from each other. Um, so that, that's what we can see in these, these two uh, these two phylogenetic trees here. 
on the left hand side we have uh, two samples that are very similar to each other so these the um, taxa in sample one cluster very closely with the taxons in sample two that is they're pretty close together on the tree Unifrac essentially calculates this by measuring how far up the tree we have to go before we reach a node that's shared by both samples. So in the tree on the left-hand side, we can see we only have to go up one level uh, to reach a node that's shared by all the by all this um, all the same by both samples. In the tree on the right-hand side, uh, we see we have to go all the way up to the very top of the tree uh, before we reach a node that's shared by both uh, sample one and sample two. Unifrac essentially is just a fraction of uh, those shared branches as over uh, is a fraction of those shared branches versus all the branches present in the tree. Um, that's unweighted unifrac. Weighted unifrac, on the other hand, um, does the same thing, but it scales the those branch lengths by abundance. So um, more abundant taxa are are more represented in in that. Great, but how do we actually go about building a phylogenetic tree if we want to look at beta diversity in terms of uh, you know, phylogenetic relatedness. Well, um, one of the things that we want to do there is, is we want to see how um, closely related all the sequences across all of our samples are to each other. Um, and to do that, we use what's called a multiple sequence alignment uh, and then arrange those sequences together by similarity. Uh, and this is represented by branch length. In fact. So the shorter branches indicate um, closer sequence similarity, longer branches, uh, less, less similar sequences. Um, and lucky for us, there's actually a plugin in Chime that allows us to build these phylogenetic trees. And shortly, when we switch back over to the notebook, uh, we'll go ahead and do exactly that. Let's quickly revisit beta diversity, though, um, and consider this. Once we've um, calculated and, and measured beta diversity between all of the samples. How do we how do we visualize that and actually analyze that data? If you recall, for alpha diversity, we get back a discrete single value for each sample, uh, which makes it very easy to compare one sample against another. For beta diversity, though, the value that we get back is actually um, the sort of dissimilarity between each uh, each pair of samples. Um, and so this ends up being fairly high dimensional data that can be difficult to visualize and sort of abstract mentally. If we change how we think about it, though, it's easy to compare it to something um, that we're all familiar with. So if instead of you know beta diversity or genetic dissimilarity, we think of the beta diversity score between each pair of samples to just be a distance. Um, so essentially, taxa that are or samples that are more um, distant from each other are more dissimilar, while taxa that are closer together are more similar to each other. We can then kind of compare that to something we're very familiar with, which is maps and you know, geographic maps. So if we think about a map, um, we can represent the distance between any two points on a map as a two-dimensional projection. We know that in, in real life, the Earth is a sphere in three dimensions. So that's a actually more difficult distance to, to determine, right? So there's, we have to account for the, the curvature of the earth and changes in altitude. And so it's not necessarily a two-dimensional distance that we're actually looking at, but we can project that three-dimensional distance on two dimensions uh, with maps that we're all familiar with. Um, now we all know that there's no perfect projection of the earth. You know, it's impossible to project a three-dimensional globe onto two dimensions, but the one thing maps typically do pretty well is conserve the distance between any two points. And that's what we see here. And we can do something very similar with our high dimensional beta diversity data um, using a tool called principal coordinate analysis or PCOA. What PCOA does is, is it essentially takes our very high dimensional um, beta diversity data um, and finds a projection of that in either two or three dimensions that maintains those relationships in terms of distance from each uh, distance between any two points. So by reducing the dimensions, uh, we can find a consistent re uh, representation of our data. Um, one side effect of this is that there may be many different projections that, that accomplish this. And often when you rerun PCOA, you might see different orientations of essentially the, the same data. Um, but what this allows us to do is to visualize our data and ask some questions about um, how these data cluster and, and um, 
are located in, in relative to each other. So for instance, we can take a look at uh, this PCOA projection of our beta diversity metrics and ask if you know, maybe they have different centroids. So uh, clustering between different groups of samples, maybe healthy and unhealthy samples, clusters around different centroids. Or if we wanna ask um, more statistically and to determine if there's a significant separation between different sets of samples, we can use a tool called Permanova. The Permanova sounds a little bit um, confusing, but it's actually just a variation of a statistical test that many of us are probably familiar with, which is an analysis of variance test or ANOVA. ANOVA essentially seeks to answer whether changes in an independent variable uh, can account for the differences in the variance of a dependent variable. So essentially, if you add salts to a glass of water, how does that uh, does that account for variances in uh, the final pH of the water? Very likely it does. Um, so that works great if we have one dependent variable, but for our beta diversity, we actually have uh, several hundred uh, dependent variables, which is the, the diversity of, of all of our taxa in our samples. Um, so for something like that, we might use what's called a MANOVA or a multivariate analysis of variance test. Um, and so this works pretty well if, if we have you know multiple dependent variables, uh, and we could use this, except that our Beta diversity data is um, very heterogeneous and not normally distributed. And so we might run into some issues if we use a, a classic MANOVA uh, statistical test. So instead, we use what's called a permuted uh, multivariate analysis of variance, or PERMANOVA for short, since that's quite a mouthful. So PERMANOVA essentially works by taking our uh, real regression model, and, uh, uh, our real regression model, wherein we, we group our samples based on what group they, they cluster with. So in this case, maybe healthy individuals uh, versus individuals with recurrent C. difficile infection. Um, we run that uh, regression model and we return what's called a, an F value, which essentially measures the goodness of fit, how well our regression fits the data. We then scramble or permute those regression models. So essentially randomly assign uh, samples to, uh, to different, different clusters. Um, and each time, uh, we, we do this several thousand times, uh, and each time we again fit the regression model uh, and calculate an F value that determines how well that regression model fits the, the data. Uh, we can then compare the F value of our real regression model that we ran initially against all of these scrambled or permuted F values. Um, and this uh, comparison actually returns a P value that will allow us to determine if uh, the, the um, real regression model statistically significant, is statistically significant in terms of uh, describing the variance uh, in our data. We can also calculate the overall amount of variance that's described um, by that regression model. Um, we'll actually go through uh, doing exactly this in the notebook uh, here shortly when we switch back over. So actually let's uh, right now go ahead and, and do that. At this point, the denoising step in data two should have been finished. So let's switch back over to the notebook and take a look. Yep, so it looks like that denoising step uh, took about six minutes for me. Hopefully yours is done at this point as well. If you ran into any issues, please don't hesitate to ask the TAs. They'll be happy to help you. Um, and so, let, let, and excuse me. Um, if you did, weren't able to run that step, you can run this um, cell underneath, which will essentially copy at, over all of the um, results from the data um, process into your current directory from that treasure chest where all of our outputs are stored. Um, so what we can do now is actually take a look at, at how that um, denoising step works and visualize the you know, statistics that come out of that. So actually, before we do that, let's take a look at the output that we got from data, from the data two process uh, in our file directory over here. So we now can see our uh, data file directory that's within that materials directory. And we see that there's three new Chime artifacts. Uh, one is called table, and that just contains the um, abundance of each of our identified ASVs. Um, the second one above that is called representative sequences. And this contains the um, actual ASVs that were identified by the data to <clears throat> process. Uh, lastly is this thing called denoising stats, which is essentially a summary of how well that, that data two step works um, and what sort of filtering it did. Um, so we might be interested in taking a look at this. 
And so uh, let's go ahead and run this cell, which will use the metadata uh, plugin to tabulate our denoising stats into a visualization. Um, and then we can go ahead and switch back over to the Chime 2 viewer to take a look at the results of that denoising step uh, and see how successful that was. Um, this really shouldn't take very long, um, but it will be very informative in terms of telling us how, uh, how many of our, our sequences were uh, filtered out and whether we have enough data to, to continue moving on. Great, so now within this data directory, we can see the denoising stats.qzv file. Uh, we'll go ahead and download that and switch back over to our Chime 2 viewer. So let's um, close this. If you click on this, this header up here, this will take you back to this uh, uh, homepage. And here we can upload our second visualization, which is our denoising stats. So again, here we just have a, essentially a, a data table that describes the results of the step. Um, on the left, we can see all eight of our samples are listed. Um, and this first column just tells us how many reads we had in each one of these uh, to begin with. So again, we have you know between 25,000 and 125,000 reads to begin with. Um, the second column will tell us how many of those were filtered out by that initial filter and trim step. So it'll that will remove any reads that are just of low average quality. Um, and we can see here that for all of these, um, we have, you know, with the exception of one, we have upwards of 98% of reads um, passing the filter. Um, and this one was still upwards of 90%. And so that tells us that our, our sequencing uh, quality was, was actually very good. Um, we shouldn't be too worried about, you know, the, the results that came out of our sequencing. Um, that too then, so this will also list uh, samples that are, that remain after our denoising. So this is after, uh, essentially removing any reads that couldn't be assigned to uh, an ASV within data two. Um, it'll also then tell us how many of our reads were non-chimeric. Um, and so after removing chimeras, uh, how many reads were left? And we can see in this last column sort of how many of our initial reads passed all the way through to the very end of this, this data two step. Um, and for most of them, we see that, you know, it's upwards of 80% of, of our reads uh, are still remaining. One of them seems to be a little bit lower, but um, for the purposes of our, our data today, of our, our, our process today, that'll be just fine. Uh, and we don't have to worry about, you know, removing data or anything. Okay, so let's go back to the notebook uh, and start taking a look at diversity. So a quick overview again, uh, we're looking at alpha diversity within samples, as well as beta diversity between samples. Um, and the first thing that we have to do, like we mentioned, is build our phylogenetic tree. So again, using our representative sequences, we can use the phylogeny plugin within Chime to build this phylogenetic tree. So let's go ahead and run this cell. Um, and what this will do, it will take our representative sequences and build several uh, Chime artifacts and output them to a directory that we'll just call tree. And we'll take a look here in a second at what exactly that does. Um, but um, what we'll also do is, is actually uh, have, a, have a look at our tree and, and see what that looks like. Um, so for visualizing our tree, we can use uh, what's called the Empress plugin within Chime 2. And so what that will do is we'll take the Chime artifact that we just constructed. Um, if we see our, our tree directory on the left-hand side here. Uh, we now have four new Chime artifacts. Um, including one called rooted tree. So rooted tree is what we'll essentially be using uh, moving forward as our phylogenetic tree. Um, and if we run this cell, uh, Chime, will, uh, yeah, Chime will actually build us a visualization of our tree that we can again take over to the Chime 2 viewer, um, take a look at um, you know, uh, what, what that tree looks like and see what, what we can kind of glean from that. So uh, let's go ahead and do that. We can go to our file directory again, download this new visualization that's called empress.qzv, and bring that over to the Chime 2 viewer. Again, if we click on this header, that'll take us to um, the homepage again, where we can upload our newly constructed phylogenetic tree. Um, so right now, it doesn't really look like much. Uh, and without knowing the tech, specific tax, taxonomy assignments of each of our ASVs, we won't really be able to learn a lot from this tree. Um, right now, it's in a, we can change though the, the layout uh, that we choose to, to view our tree. 
Um, right now, it's in what's called an unrooted format, which essentially means there, there's no sort of central root from which all of the sequences uh, begin. We can also switch that to be a rectangular view, which you might be more familiar with, um, or a circular view. So now we do have sort of a, a rooted tree. So this is the, the sort of root sequence. And we can see that there's immediately some divergence into different clades. Um, if we want to change the branch lengths, right now, the, the branch lengths are just considered normal, which means that um, branch length correlates to uh, genetic dissimilarity from each other. So longer branch lengths mean more genetic divergence between, um, between clades. We can choose to ignore branch lengths and make it all um, very similar, uh, or we can make it ultrametric, which essentially just means that branch lengths are adjusted, so we get this nice circular format. Um, so like I said, there's not much we can actually get from this, this uh, phylogenetic tree right now. Um, but later on, uh, at the end of the course, there'll be a task for, for you to work on on your own, uh, where you'll actually return to this phylogenetic tree and label it with some associated metadata as well as our taxonomy assignments uh, to learn a little bit more about our communities. Okay, so let's go back to our notebook for now um, and continue on with um, calculating diversity metrics for our communities. So as you might expect, Chime actually has a plugin called diversity, which we can use to calculate many of the diversity metrics we're interested in today. We can call that Chime plugin and specifically the action called Core Metrics Phylogenetic, uh, which will then use our table of ASV reads that we got from, from Data2, as well as the tree we just constructed in the last step uh, to calculate um, several different diversity metrics that we might be interested in. One of the other things we have to add to this step is what's called sampling depth. Um, and this is actually to normalize the data um, due to something that is actually an artifact of sequencing. So if you recall, when we were looking at the, the sequence reads from each of our samples, we saw some pretty drastic variance in the, the number of reads. One of our samples had uh, 125,000 reads, while another had, uh, as lot, had far less, I think about 25,000. Um, and so you might think that that's actually a function of you know, the number of taxa in a sample or the amount of DNA that's present in a read. Uh, but that's actually not the case, since it's actually uh, practice, standard practice to normalize the amount of DNA going into each um, sequencing sample. So uh, the number of reads is actually just a sort of an artifact of um, random chance in sequencing, uh, but it can drastically affect uh, our results if we don't do anything about it before calculating diversity. Um, and that's because of this. If you imagine a, a sample with you know half a million reads, um, any taxa present in that sample that are super rare, that don't show up a lot, are more likely to be sampled in that sample than, for instance, a sample wherein you only have a couple thousand reads. So if we calculated directly the, the alpha diversity of those two samples, we would artificially see that there's actually higher alpha diversity in the sample that had more reads than in the one that had fewer reads. Uh, so to combat that, what we do is we identify the sampling depth, which essentially tells Chime to take you know, 8,000, uh, to randomly select 8,000 sequences uh, and use only those sequences to calculate diversity. It's not a perfect system since we end up losing uh, a lot of a lot of our data, um, but it does mean that we can compare samples with different sampling depths directly to each other. Um, we'll also add in this metadata file, which we'll use later on when we want to compare the diversity metrics between different groups of samples um, and identify where we want our, our diversity uh, diversity artifacts to be saved, which is this diversity directory. So Chime will now go through and calculate alpha and beta diversity metrics uh, for all of our samples uh, using these data, um, including you know, the phylo phylogenetic data that we got from our, our tree that we just constructed. Um, and in just a second, we'll use these to take a look at both alpha and beta diversity. Great, so that seems to have worked pretty well. It took about 20 seconds on my end. Um, and so if we refresh our directory over here, we'll again see a brand new directory, uh, a brand new file folder called uh, diversity. And if we open that up, we can see all sorts of new uh, Chime artifacts as well as visualizations. Uh, we could download any of these visualizations and take them to the viewer uh, to get an idea. Um, but first, what we'll actually do is um, take a look at uh, Shannon 
index, which if you'll recall is the metric we'll use uh, to estimate alpha diversity between our samples. In this case, Chime didn't create a visualization for uh, our Shannon index, so we'll have to do that ourselves. And so in this step, uh, we'll again call the Chime diversity plugin. And in this case, uh, use the action alpha group significance uh, to build a visualization of our uh, Shannon index. So we can run this cell where we take a look at exactly what we did. We call, we uh, as an input file, we use that Shannon vector we just calculated. We also include the metadata file, uh, and you'll see why that's important in a second, since really what we're doing is uh, comparing the alpha diversity between our healthy and unhealthy groups. Okay, so now it's saved this visualization to our diversity directory uh, in a chime, uh, chime visualization called alpha groups. So if we go over here, um, same process as usual, download the alpha groups visualization, go back to the Chime 2 viewer, start over here we can take a look at our alpha diversity plots so here we can see um, on the left hand side we have our, our shannon index right now the default x uh, the default x-axis is the collection date when samples were taken and that's not very informative since we have mostly one sample per um, uh, per, per collection timestamp so if we go up to the this uh, drop down at the top that says column, we can select which metadata column we want to use as our grouping. In this case, we'll click on disease state, uh, which will separate it into healthy and un unhealthy individuals. So now we can see a comparison of the uh, alpha diversity for both um, healthy individuals on the right hand side, as well as individuals with recurrent C. difficile infection on the left hand side. As you can see, there's a pretty um, pretty drastic decrease in overall alpha diversity in those folks with uh, recurrent C. difficile infection. Generally, in longer living, very healthy individuals, we see higher alpha diversity, although it's not a, a, a perfect metric of um, health or, or, or unhealth, uh, but this generally agrees with sort of uh, the, the knowledge in the field that is um, having really low alpha diversity uh, can be a, a general indicator of, of unhealthiness. If we scroll down, we'll also see that uh, Chime went ahead and did some significance testing for us. So in this case, it ran a, a Criscall Wallace test, which is a non-parametric significance test to see if there is a, a statistically significant separation in alpha diversity between uh, our two groups. And in this case, we see there's, uh, we have calculated an H value as a, um, from our Crisco Wallace test, as well as the p-value that tells us that this is in fact a statistically significant result. Um, the numbers in your visualization might uh, vary a little bit from what you see here, um, and that's just because we randomly selected, uh, you know, 8,000 sequences from each sample. Um, so the sequences in in your alpha diversity metrics might be a little bit different from mine, and that can change the results um, a little bit here and there. Cool, so that's essentially an, an overview of alpha diversity. Uh, it gives us a good idea of how we can measure um, you know, within sample diversity between all of our samples. So let's go back to our notebook now. And with the last few minutes, we'll take a look at beta diversity before we take a break. So for beta diversity, um, in this case, we will take a look at the weighted unifractus. So if you recall, weighted unifract is a measure of beta diversity that takes into account phylogenetic relatedness, um, as well as abundance of taxa within our samples. So before we check for significance, let's go to our file directory and download the uh, weighted unifrac underscore emperor file. So emperor is a, another plugin that allows us to visualize these things. Uh, and we'll download this visualization and take a look at it as well. Okay, so now that we've downloaded it, we can switch back over to the viewer. Um, and open up this, this beta diversity visualization. So if you recall, um, what we'll see here is a PCOA projection of our beta diversity. So again, beta diversity is very high dimensional data that tells us essentially the distance between each of our samples. Um, and in this case, we see the PCOA projection um, first in two dimensions, but we can also click and drag uh, and see that across three dimensions. Um, the axes on each, uh, each of the axes also contains a label that describes the amount of variance uh, that can be described by that axis. So we can see axis one 
describes uh, about two thirds of the uh, variation that we see in our data already. And if we combine that with axis two, uh, we're up to nearly 90% of the uh, overall variance in our, in our data. Um, so that, that's pretty good. It looks like we found a projection that can really describe the beta diversity of our data pretty well. Um, right now, though, since we just have a bunch of red dots, that doesn't mean very much to us. Uh, what we can do, though, is go to this right-hand side uh, to that first dropdown. It says select a color category. And again, choose that disease state column from our metadata file. Uh, and this will color the dots accordingly. Right, so now we can see the beta diversity between our healthy samples in red and our pre-FMT or uh, unhealthy samples uh, in blue. And we can actually see that, especially along axis one, these diverge pretty significantly. So it looks like healthy individuals are more closely, um, are, are closer to each other, sort of on the right hand of the axis, uh, while unhealthy individuals are closer to each other on the, on the left hand of the axis. Um, and if we rotate the projection, we can see that, you know, they might also cluster around different groups. Um, and this might um, be due to a few different reasons, right? So we can uh, take a look from, from the top down. There's also a little bit of clustering that happens with some of the healthy individuals. Um, and if we had additional metadata files or metadata, uh, yeah, if we had additional metadata for all of our samples, we could color by that as well uh, to determine if there was any significant clustering going on. Um, but if we want to actually uh, measure statistically whether the um, separation between these samples is significant, we can go back to the notebook and conduct our PermaNova that we were discussing earlier. Okay, so um, the last piece for our, our, our sort of diversity metrics here is doing exactly that. So using this uh, unifrac distance matrix that we constructed in that uh, core metrics phylogenetic uh, step a few, a few minutes ago, um, we can input that into this Adonis action, which will go through and actually conduct the PermaNova that we described in the slides. Uh, we pair that with our, our metadata file, as well as the specific column in the metadata file that we want to use as our sort of clustering. So in this case, we're testing for significance between healthy and unhealthy individuals. Um, so if we go ahead and run this, um, now Chime will go through and calculate that PermaNova and tell us whether or not this is a statistically significant separation uh, in terms of beta diversity between our healthy and unhealthy samples. Um, again, this will output a visualization into our diversity folder uh, that we'll call permanova.qzb. Uh, and this will be the last thing that we do here for, for now, um, but we can download this file on the left-hand side. And one last time, head back over to the Chime 2 viewer, um, click and drag, and uh, open up our permanova.qzb visualization. So this is just a data table that describes to us the results of the permanova. In this case, we are looking at uh, the, if the separation between healthy and unhealthy individuals was significant. And if we go all the way over to the right side, uh, we see the sort of the calculated F value for our model. Um, and we also see this R squared, which describes the percent of variance that can be described by our regression model. And so that, that's about 56% of the variation that can be described just by clustering between healthy and unhealthy individuals. And that's pretty significant. So that tells us that this is a, you know, a pretty significant result. Uh, and indeed the p-value is uh, 0.029. So uh, anything less than 0.05 can be considered to be statistically significant. Um, so that tells us this result is in fact significant. And there's definitely a uh, separation in terms of beta diversity between healthy and unhealthy samples in our data set. Great, so uh, at this point, we'll switch back over to the notebook very briefly um, and we'll have a little teaser for what we're doing next. So um, sort of the last piece of this uh, um, Chime 2 pipeline is identifying what organisms our ASVs actually are. So right now we have these representative sequences, and we have sort of the, yeah, the, the sequences from the uh, V4 region of the 16S gene, but we don't know what taxa they each belong to. Um, so maybe during the break, you can think about how you would go about going from a sequence directly to an organism's name, sort of assigning the identity of these taxa um, to uh, their sequences. Um, but with that, I think we're out of time for this part of the session, and so we'll take a break here. Uh, and we'll be back in 20 minutes, I believe, uh, for to finish up the course. Um, so go 
I'm gonna take uh, take a little break, get a glass of water, uh, and I'll see you back here uh, in about 20 minutes. Also happy to take any questions right now if there are any that are outstanding on Slack. Um, but if not, then uh, the, yeah, feel free to, to ask questions during the intermission as well. Uh, the TAs will be happy to, to help you there. Thank you very much, and I'll see you in 20 minutes. Thank <laughs> you.